Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 7. It can be found on page 605 of the Bible in front of you. It reads, In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. This is the word of the Lord. What a great day to be here. Amen, right? Some of (laughs) y'all. Very rarely do we get to celebrate in um, the testimony of a child who I think will be able to someday be tempted with the great temptation to say to a youth group or to a college ministry someday, to look back and say, I didn't really have that dramatic of a testimony. Ha, ha, ha. No, you do, Carly. Where, where's Carly? Where is she? She's somewhere. Okay. Oh, she went back. Yeah. Okay. She went back. Yes. The reason why I say that is because it is, to me, the amazing grace of God to plant us under people who teach us the gospel of God. Talk about testifying of a work only that God can do. So to me, we have the greatest testimony, those of us who could say, I didn't know the sin that other people knew by the grace of God. So we have a great day to celebrate. We celebrate her. We celebrate all the things that God is doing in our life. We are starting a new series. We started it last week. We are um, talking about knowing God. We, last week, we looked at A.W. Tozer's quote real briefly, which said, What comes to our minds when we think about God might be the most important thing about us. What comes to our minds when we think about God might be the most important thing about us because what we think about God, what? Matters. For those of you who were here last week, I said there's going to be the statement that we say every week, knowing God matters yes in every walk of life and so we're going to go through these uh, attributes of God looking at these characteristics what does scripture say about God so that we can know God because knowing God matters let me ask you this have you ever had a friend or had a conversation with somebody that's a know-it-all any of you okay yeah hopefully you're not married to them if you are please keep that to yourself but there is, we all know the pleasure, uh, speaking facetiously, of talking to someone who wants to convince you that they know everything about a topic. And if you move to another topic thinking, surely if I can get away from this topic, get to another topic, then that person wants to then say, oh, you think I knew a lot about that topic. Wait till I can tell you about this. Oh, we're talking about this now? Oh, and then whenever you try to get in something and say, yeah, I had this experience here, then usually these are the people that try to trump your story, try to outdo you, out Waterburger your story, so to speak, and try to tell you that my story, my experience, my knowledge is better than yours. Oh man, it's a joy to talk to salesmen like this. Salesmen are supposed to be good at convincing us that they know more about the product than we do. And we've all been there. At some point, we just want to go ahead and say to that person, hey, let me just stop you right there. You don't know as much as you think you know. You're not helping your situation. And it's actually costing you (laughs) to keep talking about this that you really know little about. 
one of the saddest conversations that I've had with people, and it's usually with those older people that I visit either in the hospital or I come to talk to them, or maybe you say, hey, can you go visit my neighbor? This is what they're going. And, and this uh, individual says to me, oh, preacher, glad you're here, but I've got an arrangement with God. I've made peace with the man upstairs. Me and the man upstairs, we have this sort of arrangement. He understands me. He knows where I am. And we kind of made this deal a long time ago. So I'm good. Don't mess with me. Don't talk with me. I get it. You think you're a know-it-all preacher? Well, I'm telling you, I've already connected. We're good. Like me and the man upstairs got it all down. And these trite, these pithy statements about God and our relationship to God reveal a lot to me. Unfortunately, the person communicating what they're saying about this deal with the man upstairs, unfortunately, most likely, has never had a real encounter with a living God. They are ignorant about God, and they are ignorant about themselves in relationship to God. They have not encountered the God that we see in Scripture We must know the God of Scripture. We must not create in our minds what we think the God of Scripture is. We must not like say, okay, if if I'm this man and God created us like him, then, then he must be more like me than I am like him. This passage that we see in Isaiah is Isaiah's encounter with the living God, one who We would think, Isaiah, we would think if there's anybody who understood God, it would be Isaiah. And I pray that we will notice some important things from this text that's going to help us understand and know God. Why? Because knowing God really matters for everyday life. So today we're going to learn something about God. We're going to explore and learn the God who is Holy, holy, holy. We're going to unpack some text today, and I, I pray that we would be different after reading this text. Let's pray, oh God, we just sang about your holiness. God, I I confess we really don't know all that that means. Give us, please, Lord, a glimpse this morning on what it means that you, O God, are holy. Affect us, please, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's look at several things from this text. We're going to unpack this. We have a lot to look at because there is a lot going on in this amazing scripture. Verse 1, we see Isaiah says this, it records this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. In the year that King Uzziah died. King Uzziah was one of the kings of Israel. King Uzziah was ordained as king at the age of six. You think Carly's young? (laughs) King Uzziah was ordained to be king at the age of six. He reigned for 52 years until his death. That is a long time for the people of Israel to have one king, one figurehead, one person on the throne. And in all of the list of kings, in fact, if you look at the list of kings throughout the Bible and you, you, you can sort of look at, here's the bad list of kings, here's the kings that are like, oops, oops, oop, oop, whoa, really oops, you know, there's a whole big list of those kings. There's a very short list of kings where it says in Scripture that they 
were righteous before God, or they behaved well, or they were good in the eyes of the Lord, Uzziah falls under that list. This is, for the most part, a king who did well. If you, weren't, if you were to rank the kings, you would probably put David up there at the first, and you'd probably put Josiah second, Hezekiah would be a, a third, and, and somewhere fourth, probably before Solomon, because you learn about Solomon some stuff, there would be King Uzziah. However, his power and his rule went to his head. There came a day in his life where after being king, he forced his way into the temple and he sought to do and perform some of the priestly duties that were only reserved for just a few people, not for the king of Israel. And King Uzziah busted through and said, I am the king. Hear me roar. I'm going to do this. I am the closest to God. I'm going to therefore do these acts. And it was forbidden for him to do that. Immediately God condemned this act, struck him with leprosy. And by the mercy of God and only the mercy of God, he did extend King Uzziah's life until this season. In the year that King Uzziah died, the reign of a mostly good king comes to an end we don't know the year exactly it's probably around 8th century bc that king uzziah died ironically uh, historians tell us that uh, around 8th century bc there was this little village that started called roma so the year that king uzziah dies the year that isaiah was given a vision of God that was going to begin a ministry for him to prophesy about the king of kings was the year that Rome began. See the connection there? Jesus is about to be foretold. Rome begins over here. Part of the foretelling of Jesus is there's going to be these people in this village, Roma, that would hang him on a cross. This is the year that King Uzziah died. It was most likely a year of grief, confusion, sadness. There is no heir. There is no ruler. There's no majestic figurehead to sit on this throne. You think you might be discouraged the way our country is being led? Now, last year, the next few years, you might look at things and go, how did we get to this place? This is a 52-year reign, and now there's no vision of what God is planning. This is a year of turmoil. We don't know exactly where Isaiah was when he sees this vision. Many say that he was in the temple because of what we see in verse 4. Many think that he was actually in the palace room where the throne of Uzziah was because, and we'll get to this a little later, Uzziah and Isaiah were close. They were close, and he was grieving. He was weeping. We don't know where he was, but we do know what Isaiah saw. In the year that King Uzziah died, verse 1, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. In the year that the king was removed from the throne, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up. The train of his robe filled the temple. The one that he saw has a name. Isaiah said, he he sort of names him. Verse 1, Isaiah refers to him as Lord, capital L, lowercase o, r, d. We see that here, that he gives him the name Lord. Lord, capital L, lowercase O-R-D. But in verse 4, we see the seraphim describe the one that Isaiah is seeing as Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. What's going on with our English translations here? Why when Isaiah refers to him as Lord, it's capital L, but lowercase O-R-D. And why when the seraphim refer to him as Lord, it's capital, it's all caps, L-O-R-D. Well, this is where English translations really fail us. What's happening here is when Isaiah is referring to him as Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, it's the word Adon Adonai. It's a title. 
Isaiah is giving him a title. This is the Lord. This is Adonai, which means the sovereign one. It actually means the most exalted sovereign one. So Isaiah is coming to the point where he is like, I don't know what else to say about what I'm seeing, but this is capital L, lowercase o-r-d for us, but for him it's Adonai, the exalted one. When the seraphim are declaring his name, they're not giving him a title. They are saying capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, the word his name. It's like this is not his title. His name is Yahweh. We don't interpret that in our scriptures because it's, it's a Hebrew word, Yahweh. There are no vowels in it. It's just it's what it is. It's like what we would describe it or write it out would be Y-H-W-H. Yahweh, or Jehovah is the way we say it. The angels, the seraphim, are declaring what you know him to be, this title that you're giving him. He actually has a name, and his name is Yahweh. This is important because Isaiah did not say that he saw another ruler. He did not say that he saw somebody else entitled with Uzziah's throne. He saw the one exalted sovereign on the throne. I saw Adon Adonai. I saw the one who's got the greatest title of all. I saw the, the throne sitter of all throne sitters. And he was right. What a sight it was. Adon Adonai Yahweh is before him on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Think about that. Our culture, we don't necessarily we do our 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 fair share of showing uh regal things especially in the highest offices when a president leaves another president comes or a president is deceased there's some regality but 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 how many of you stay up and watch royal weddings you don't have to raise your hand some of you did that's okay you can raise your hands it's fine I don't really get into royal weddings. I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're be, mostly because they're usually on at 3 in the morning, and I'm like, I don't, whatever, you know. Um, but the train of his robe filled the temple. Most cultures, when they have a royal wedding like this, how long the train is, is a demonstration of how majestic the person with the train is. I've had two encounters where I witnessed something regal like this. One of them I've shared with you before was a time when I walked out in front of me there was one man and behind me there was another man and I cared deeply about both these men and we walked out and and one of the men had a Bible uh, one of the men had a Bible and he stood right here and then I came up here and then the other man which was my dad stood right here and then I watched uh, this procession of people groomsmen and bridesmaids come in and the groomsmen were doing some funny joke thinking they're all cute but what was really cool was the bridesmaid that were coming in there was something on their face like 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 they couldn't believe they're like attached to this groomsman that's playing this joke on the groom because they had come through the doors and they're communicating something with me jason you don't know what you're about to see it's amazing. And every one of them, as soon as the, the bridesmaids came through the door, like they're coming through and I, they're making eye contact with me. They really cared about me. They're like, you're about to be blown away. It's amazing. It's stunning. You won't believe it. And as they got close to me, they would even kind of tear up because they're seeing me getting kind of emotional. And sure enough, the doors open. The kind of music pauses dramatically, of course. The doors open. And I, I literally forgot everything that I was supposed to think and do and say I couldn't believe it my whole life I prayed for this moment my whole life I prepped for this moment the girls walking forward were warning me you're about to be taken back and sure enough and it wasn't the train of the robe the train of the dress it was the one that was coming to me in splendor and beauty what Isaiah is saying here I am taken back because the Lord who's sitting on, on, on a throne is high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple like it was so majestic, it was so holy. Then we see in verse 2, he saw something else. Above him stood the seraphim. 
These are creatures. Angelic creatures around. They have an assignment. They are created beings. Listen to the description of them. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. You might be wondering, like I have, why the anatomical description given here. Well, it's important to remember something about God when he creates his creatures. When God creates creatures, he creates them in a way that's suitable for their habitat. He creates creatures because he's placing them in a, in a, in a location, a place where they can survive and they can exist. For example, he places birds, and most birds gives them, uh, like, you're going to rule the air, you're going to fly in the air. So how does he create birds? He gives them light bone structure. He p- gives them feathers. He gives them wings. He gives them good eyesight so they don't have to, like, get, you know, crawl on the ground. They can see food because they're environment will be in the air flying he creates fish he gives them scales and gills and fins because they're going to be in the water i'm creating these creatures this way because their atmosphere their environment dictates this is the best for them these creatures created by god these seraphim had six wings two covered the face They covered the eyes and the face because they could not bear and see the glory of God. Back in Exodus, when Moses was having this conversation with God, and he was at, it's at, toward the end of Exodus, Moses is telling God, God, I've seen your miracles. I've seen you do this. You've acted this way. We've seen you show up in a, a cloud and by fire. and We've seen this uh, smoke. We've seen all these amazing things. We saw what you did. We see what you're doing. But, oh, God, can I just ask, can I, can I see your face? And God said to him, oh, Moses, you have no clue what you're asking there's no way you can see my face and live and so in exodus 33 toward the end there it talks about how he he carves out this place in the mountain he sticks moses in it and he says i'll tell you what i will pass by you you can see the back of me but your my face you cannot see why even seeing the back of holy God made the people that saw Moses be afraid of Moses because his face was affected, his body was affected. Just seeing the back of God, seeing God's face apart from Christ, we'll get to that later in November, but seeing God's face would have destroyed Moses and the seraphim have two wings to cover, to protect their eyes because they are dwelling in the presence of of a holy God. What about the wings that cover the feet? How is that helpful? Also in Exodus, we see when Moses is coming up, just kind of wandering around, he had no pursuit of God, he wasn't looking for God, there's this bush that's acting strangely. You know the story in Exodus 3? It's on fire, but it's not being consumed. And he goes over to it and goes, what's going on? And as he gets closer to it, it speaks to him. The messenger of God says, You better take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. See, feet, shoes, were a symbol of creatureliness. Creatureliness means you are detached. You are not the creator. You walk, you stumble, there's dirt attached there. You better better cover your feet in the presence of a holy God. These seraphims covered their eyes they covered their feet because they are creatures and of course two for getting around for flying so isaiah grieving and mourning the loss of his king the disarray of the nation a season of true sorrow and sadness without really even pursuing it he sees Adonai, Yahweh, the seraphim, and he was presented with a message. So you get the scene. 
hear the message. So we saw the seraphim, it says, and one called out to another and said, verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. There are many ways that we English speakers might choose to express or highlight a point that we would like to make. Many of you who write or send emails, if you really want to make a point, you'll underline something. You'll maybe put bold, you'll boldface it somehow. Maybe you use all caps. Maybe you highlight it with a color. Maybe you italicize it. These are all the ways we like to uh, make a point or express something. And one of the things that your English teachers will love, students, is if you really don't really want to make an exclamation, but you want to really annoy them, put something at the end of your sentence that really probably doesn't belong, but we use a lot, which is called what? An exclamation mark. A point of emphasis saying, did you know what I just said? (laughs) Exclamation mark. Notice this word. We use air quotes. Or quotes, did you get what I'm saying? That's what we do in our language. But in the Jewish tradition, also many other traditions, even though they would use some of those tools, they would also employ another method of communication to express something dramatically, and that is the method of repetition. We see this in the New Testament from Jesus when he says, Amen and Amen. He's emphasizing, yes, yes, this is true. When he says to him, says to his people, truly, truly, I say to you, he's not just like using poetic language. He's not just saying, uh, uh, I want to really rope you in with the first word. No, he's saying, truly, this is true, true. Okay, I'm saying it again, truly, truly, what I'm about to say is important. It's almost as if, it's like the captain coming on the speaker. Now hear this. What you're about to hear is so important that I've got to say it twice. We can see this form of accentuation all throughout Scripture. When it is used, it is unmistakable that it is a statement of expression. So notice that the seraphim here do not just say, Yahweh is holy. They don't say, He is holy, holy. They exclaim, calling to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. R.C. Sproul reminds us, nowhere else is an attribute of God taken to the third degree of expression and praise nowhere else in scripture only the holiness of god nowhere in scripture do we see god described as love 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 nowhere do we see mercy 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 kind 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 just 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 we don't even see in scripture the 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 Three-tier sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. This is the God that Isaiah encountered. The God to which the seraphim, who were with him all the time, say, holy, holy, holy. Emphasizing what you are seeing, Isaiah, is so far removed from your, you as a creature. This is a holy other. This should move us. It should astound us. This should get us stirring in our hearts. I mean, we are more than a bunch of dumb bricks, right? You you know where I'm going with this? We are more than a bunch of dumb bricks. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called 
and the house was filled with smoke. This should move us. It should when we sing that song, holy, holy, holy. We can either be like the salesman who's just talking like we don't really know about, or we can confess together as a church body. I don't really even know what that means. I don't even want to say it because if I say it, it, I don't know what it means. Let me ask you, when you meet God, talk with Him, when you encounter Him, when you really it's just you and Him, is there a part of you that's shaken a little bit? Isaiah responds. The foundations respond. They're shook, but Isaiah's response, look at this. We've learned about Uzziah. We've learned about the seraphim. We've even learned a little bit about Adon, Adonai, and Yahweh is holy, holy, holy. But let's remember real briefly who Isaiah is. Isaiah was the model of integrity. Like, you think you know a godly person compared to Isaiah? Like, not godly, right? I mean, Isaiah was a man who walked with the Lord. He was very close to the king. Many people realized and believed that he was one of those um, close ones that, like when Uzziah wanted to walk this way away from God, nope, Isaiah was there. Like, to correct Uzziah. Okay, Isaiah was close to the Lord. Where Isaiah was when he saw this, we don't really know. But this is not a man who was close to Uzziah because he was political. He was close to Uzziah because he was a godly man of integrity. Everyone knew it. Yet, just one glimpse of Yahweh, and he falls apart. Look with me in verse 5. And I said, woe is me, for I'm lost, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, my eyes, and hear what he says, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh. What's going on here? Well, John Calvin wrote in his book, The Institutes, he said, as long as our gaze is fixed on this world, we have no problem with our self-image. Did you hear that? As long as our gaze is fixed on this world, we have no problem with our self-image. We flatter ourselves as something only slightly less than demigods. Only until for one second we lift our gaze to heaven and contemplate what kind of being God really is. And that's when the former security and smugness is annihilated. That's what's going on with Isaiah here. Man of integrity encountering the living God, and he's trembling, he's shaken. There is never a scene in Scripture when someone encounters the living God like this and they're left the same. There's never a scene in Scripture when someone encounters the living God and says, okay, God, yeah, let's, let's talk. I'm going to pull out my good works for you. Here's what I'm bringing to the relationship, God. It's not the way it works with the holy God. If Isaiah is trembling to this, imagine the rest of his people, if they were to see this. What's really happening when he says, woe is me, I am lost? There are several ways to translate that word lost. Some people say, I am dead, I am lost. I actually like the translation that says, I am undone. I'm unraveled. Let me explain why this is important when somebody like Isaiah said, woe is me. Hang in there with me. This is important. In Jewish prophecy and in the New Testament, there were things issued to people called oracles. There were oracles of blessings. We've heard some of those oracle of blessings. We see them in Scripture. One oracle of blessing comes in Jude, and it comes in the Old Testament that goes something like this. May the Lord bless you and keep you and what? Make his face to shine upon you. We're going to see later that's impossible for that to be a blessing apart from Christ. 
That's an oracle of blessing. But I want to remind you of what's happening in this moment, in this time. There is such a thing called an oracle of woe. An oracle of doom pronounced over the people. In fact, in the book of Amos, which is few books over from Isaiah, chapters 1 and chapter 2, we see sections that begin this way. For three transgressions and a fourth, woe to you, Damascus. For three transgressions and a fourth, woe to you, Gaza. For three transgressions and a fourth, woe to you, Tyra. And there's more. It just keeps going. It goes people to people to people. Woe to you, Edom. Woe to you, Moab. Woe to you, Judah. And chapter 2, for three transgressions and a fourth, woe to you, Israel. Why is that important? Amos was prophesying at the time that King Uzziah was alive. Isaiah understands the oracle of woe. He's heard Amos say this. He's heard it pronounced. And Isaiah, most likely, if he's like me or like some of you, he's probably thinking, well, yeah, woe to them, woe to them, woe to them, woe to them. They're bad. That's bad. I'm close to Uzziah. We're here. We're good, right? We're okay, right? Like, we got a deal, right? I'm walking with you, right? And then he sees God, and his only response is, Woe is me. These oracles pronounced while King Uzziah was still alive, Isaiah now pronounces on himself. Why? The walls might have been shaken, but Isaiah was broken, he was undone. Not because of King Uzziah's death, he thought he was sad. Not because the nation was in turmoil. Not because the rest of the world was given a woe. But he is undone because he encountered and his eyes have seen the living God. He was undone because he lifted his gaze off of others. He lifted his gaze off himself. And he lifted his gaze at the holy God. And his only proper response is, woe is me too. R.C. Sproul says about this, Isaiah for the first time in his life knew who God was. And when Isaiah for the first time discovered who God was, Isaiah for the first time realized who he was. And he didn't like it. So as we wrap up our time, let me just ask a few questions. What if Isaiah were here today? What if his encounter with God here in Salado, maybe it was walking home from the football game, maybe it was here on Sunday morning in the church, maybe he had an encounter like that. How would we help, point of emphasis, How would we help Isaiah? What would we say to him? Wouldn't, let's be honest, wouldn't we maybe rush to him and say, oh, Isaiah, you're not that bad. Oh, Isaiah, you've really got a bad image of yourself. Come on there. Like, Like, pick yourself up, Isaiah. Come on. It's okay. I mean, God is love, love, love. We're doing that in our churches all the time. When what really matters is for people to see God for who He is so that they can finally see who they really are and cry out, Oh God, I don't deserve this moment at all. You are holy, holy Holy, even the ones around you have to cover their face. They have to cover their feet. And yet you're allowing me to have this relationship with you. I want to propose that Isaiah's response is the only proper response to a holy God. 
if I'm stunned, no offense, Kelly, but if I'm stunned by a bride who's sinful, if that stuns me and shakes me and I'm not stunned by one who is holy, 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 then my gaze is on the wrong things. I say that to my wife. She knows I have way more sinful patterns in me than her. He was undone. He was broken. And God does not leave him there that way. Look with me at what God does for Isaiah. And we don't have time to apply all of this. We're going to come back next week to apply more. But here's what he does for him. Then one of the seraphim flew to me. Love that. What are the other two wings for? I'm coming to minister to you. I can't see God. I can't see my feet. You saw something that shook you, that made you a curse yourself, bring a woe to yourself. You are now at a proper place. You are humbled. And now I'm coming near to you. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. A holy God chose to take what Isaiah said about himself, my my unclean lips, and he says, okay, I'm going to fix that for you. Isaiah did not say, I need to go through these classes and get my language right. I need to go through these classes, get my mind right. I need to go through, no, he's like, I don't have anything right about my lips. They're bad. It's so bad. I don't know what to do about it. God says, okay, I will take care of that for you. I'm holy, holy, holy. I have ministering agents coming they will purify you. Knowing God rightly matters. God does not worry about Isaiah's self-image at all. God saves him from it. He redeems him. He restores him. It's when we encounter the living God that the temple walls shake, that we are undone, that we are humbled, where all of Scripture kind of points out it's it's when we are humbled that God draws near. Why? He resists the proud. Do not ever come to God and say, okay, man, upstairs, let's work out an agreement. Woe to you if that is your approach to God. Woe to me if we ever sing or preach from this word or speak on behalf of God where we don't just go, God, we are not worthy if not by your grace. Those who have truly encountered God will say with Isaiah that he alone is holy, holy, holy. Today we want to celebrate that knowing God matters. How does knowing God is holy change things or help us or matter in our life? Cliffhanger. Come back next week. And we will work this into our lives. We will see what what does it mean by burning coal in our lips and what does that mean for us? Today, I want you to stand with me and be stunned just, just acknowledge, God, we don't really know you. You've been kind to us. You've sent us your son. And in his image, we kind of get a glimpse of you. You give us your word. You've sent Isaiah. Thank you. And some of us, let's just be honest, you might just need to, instead of joining in in song and just say, you might just need to bow. You might just need to say, God, help me. Help me know you. Make yourself known to me. For now, let's sing and declare how great this 
God is. If you find yourself a bit undone, one of the things that we continue to invite you to consider every week, you don't have to go to lunch undone. Come forward as people are exiting. We have people up here at the front just waiting. We're up here for the sole purpose just to pray with you. To come to you and just say, what can we help you with? How can we introduce you to the Christ who is the mediator between us and God? How can we introduce you to the one who's died so that you can approach the throne of God with boldness? If you have not any clue who that Jesus is, any clue how to come talk to us. We want to help you with that. For everyone else, let's go ahead and stand. Everyone can stand. And let's declare together how great our God is. Oh, mighty God, thank you for the words that we see in Isaiah. This is heavy. I mean, God... Most of the gaze of the people around our community is on opening day of football or it's on lunch. Those aren't evil things. But God, I I ask you for your mercy and grace to lift up our gaze that we would be a people that are in awe even shook by a holy, holy, holy 